Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And uh, it's a great day to be in the church. <clears throat> We're given every first Sunday of the week order to gather together and worship God and that's why we're here and I'm just glad to see you <coughs> now my <coughs> lesson this morning is if the foundations be destroyed that's what was being talked about in our scripture reading and in the long ago the psalmist asked, if the foundation is destroyed, what can the righteous do? That's Psalm 11.3. Well, now the sweet singer of Israel, David, he stirs our need to place our trust in God and says that he would. In the Lord I put my trust. That's verse 11, 1, or chapter 11.1. However, the wicked are making their plans to destroy. That comes right out of the second verse. And to accomplish this destruction, they have to destroy the foundation. David reminds us that Jehovah rules in verse 4 and is omniscient in verses 4 and 5 and is just in verses 6 and 7. God and our nation, the foundation, our, our foundation in this country is being destroyed. Our foundation as Christians is being destroyed. And it may have possibly been decimated at the point of no return at this point. Look at the wickedness all around you. We see the foundations crumbling because of the decisions our, we allow our government to make, because Satan has taken over and run rampant with all different kinds of religions that he's established. But, <coughs> pardon me, there are three things I want us to look at this morning when it comes to the foundation. Now the foundation that God said Christ's cornerstone we remember the parable of the man who built his house upon the sand and the man who built his house upon the rock but well, we want to be the ones who build on the rock but man <coughs> pardon me has taken three aspects and tore them apart. First would be the foundation of the home. The home is constantly under attack and in most cases today are, is unrecognizable. It's not what God intended. At the beginning God established a home when he made the woman for the man and presented her to Adam and called her Eve and said this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she is taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Genesis chapter 2, verses 23 through 24. This marriage relationship was to last until death do they part. Thus began the first home. The home is instituted by God was to, among other things, bring children into the world. And God told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Chapter 1, verse 28. As children grow, parents are given the responsibility of teaching and training them. Simply read Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 7 through 9. Or Proverbs 22, 6. Or Ephesians 6, uh, verses 4. And 2 Timothy 3, 15. Brother Winfred Claiborne correctly observed 
attacks against the home are numerous and so vicious that it appears to a conspiracy to destroy the home it, it, as it exists in society. Some of those attacks against the home are theological, others are social, political, or academic. There's secular humanism, and it's had a, a, a detrimental impact on every one of those uh, attacks against the, our attacks against the home. It was provided the inspiration for uh, sociologists, psychologists, anthropologists, media personnel, liberal politicians, and theologians. Now that comes out of his book, and it's on page 86 and 87. Yes, the home is being attacked and destroyed from without and from within. How often do we hear marriage degraded down to the statement of it's just a piece of paper? How many families today can actually say they're a family? They have a mother, a father, the children. Sometimes they used to be grandma and grandpa. They constituted a family. <clears throat> That's been destroyed long ago. The welfare system made sure of that. Can't have a husband in the home and collect welfare. So you can't get nothing or something for nothing. <clears throat> unless there's no father in the house. And that's probably the most important person in the home is the father. <clears throat> because he answers to Christ. How can he answer to Christ if he's not taking care of his family? They haven't taken care of their families in years and years and years. Another dark attack is how easy divorce became. Well, we have a difference of opinion, and I don't like the way you're doing things, therefore I'm going to leave you. Is that what God intended? Of course not. God never intended that. It's contrary to God's law, which actually only allows the spouse that has been sinned against by the fornicator. They're the only one that can remarry. We have come to have a a, a serial pol polygamy in our society with all this easy divorce. The home is being attacked within the marriage relationship itself. The souls of the husband, the father, the wife, the mother have been confused to such an extent that many no longer recognize what their roles are. When women's lib started way back in the 60s, it could have been even before that, women didn't need men. Well, look what's happened. They don't have men and they're raising children out of wedlock and it's just destroying the home. It's been doing this now for decades, I'm sorry to say. Look at the unisex movement of a couple of decades ago. Also went along with the way of destroying the biblically ordained roles of the parents. And most of the time that was the father. This results in children growing up without proper role models. Coupled with this, the way in which television, cell phones, laptop computers, all of that, and then on top of that, you've got the daycare center. Your child's being put in the care of someone else while you all have to go off to work. 
Now we understand today that mom and dad usually has to work, but instead of just cramming your kid in some daycare center, maybe you should try to work it out where dad can work, say, nights or evenings, and mom can be, be home with them. And when mom goes to work, dad can be with them, or vice versa. Or at least leave them with a relative, someone you trust. But no, the kids are just shoved in the daycare, the daycare raises them, and then all of a sudden they're going to school. Okay? Well, now your teachers are trying to raise your children. And the Lord knows what they're telling them. I've seen some teachers that are just, they're just plain nutty. They want to indoctrinate, indoctrinate your child and tell them that they, if they're a boy, they can be a girl, and if they're a girl, they can be a boy. And then mom and dad, or mom most of the time, has to try to figure out, how do I counteract this? With a father in the home, the father could take that responsibility and do what he needs to do and correct his children and correct the teacher if necessary. Parents have turned the training of their children over to others. And some of these kids are what we used to call latchkey kids. You know what a latchkey kid is? They come home and they're all by themselves. They're old enough to watch for themselves, but mom and dad are out working. They're not going to be home five, six, seven o'clock. So the kid is there all by themselves. Well, what are they going to do? They're going to play the computer. They're going to watch TV. They're going to do this. You know, play on their phones or what have you. And you know, if you just look over their shoulder once in a while, that what they're looking at is not what you would have them look at. Not what you would have them learn. So we wonder why we have such a godless society and why our children grow up living like animals instead of children of God. But now, this isn't the only thing. It's not just the foundation of the home that Satan's after. Satan's after the foundation of our very society used to be said, where the home goes, there goes society. Well, I think that's true. With the destruction of the home, society itself is being destroyed. There's an adage that says, like I said, where the, the home goes, the nation goes. President James A. Garfield stated, the sanctity of marriage and the family relation makes the cornerstone of our American society and our civilization. Since society is made up of people and people are built in homes. When the home fails, society suffers. And speaking of the home and its demise, Kirby Anderson wrote this in his book on dance has turned to death. Carl Wilson identifies the common pattern of family decline in ancient Greece and the Roman Empire. Notice how the, the, uh, these seven stages parallel what is happening in our nation today. In the first stage, men cease to lead their families in worship spiritually and morally and the development became secondary. Their view of God became naturalistic. Can't get much more naturalistic than what we see today. It became, at that time, naturalistic, kind of mathematical, like the law of probabilities, and mechanical by the things that they had. Well, in the second stage, Men selfishly neglect the care of their wives and their children. 
and pursue material wealth, political power or military power, and cultural development. Material values began to dominate the thought, and the man began to exalt his own role as an individual. Remember, we talked about this morning we are to be servants of God, not have Him be a servant of ours. Well, the third stage that developed involved a change in the men's sexual values. Oh, no, 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 Jim, we can't go there. Let's not go there. Well, you have to. Because men at that time in Rome and, and all, they were turning to younger women. Sadly enough, they were turning to one another, which we know as homosexuality. Ultimately, there was a double standard that was set up and we still have that double standard today. Only it's, it's even worse. Not only is it women with women and men with men, but it's, it's little boys. It's transsexuals, uh, whatever you want to call them. They're, they're trying to tell little boys and little girls that they can be men if they're a little girl, that they can be a, a, a woman if they're a boy. And they're literally mutilating these children's bodies and taking these children and warping their minds. Why is that? Well, don't you think it goes all the way back to the home where the father is in charge? Take the father out of the picture, it gets bad. But when you take everything, uh, the mother out of the picture also, and start brainwashing children, it's even worse. When we allow things like this to happen, well, we can't do anything but expect our society to get worse and worse. The role of the woman at home with the children lost its value and status years ago. Just the thought that we put the emphasis on our carnal sexual feelings, it, it, it's just degrading. Is it natural for a man and a woman? Of course it is how else are we going to have children? How else are we going to raise another generation? But when you let it run rampant and out of control and do what Satan wants you to do, you might as well give up. The fifth stage of this is the husband and the wives, they start competing against each other. They compete for the money or the the home leadership or the affection of the children and the result is what? Hostility, frustration, and possibly homosexuality in the, in the children. Many marriages ended up in separation and divorce simply because of this. Many children were unwanted, aborted, abandoned, molested, undisciplined. And the more undisciplined children became, the more social pressure there was not to have children. And the breakdown of the home again produced anarchy. It starts in the home, doesn't it? But it moves on. It moves on into schools and into society and and we allow everybody else to raise our children and teach them things that we would never have taught them. The sixth stage 
was selfish individualism. It grew and carried over into society, fragmenting it into smaller and smaller groups of loyalties. You know, we talk about this clan of people over here, this kind of person over here, all the blacks or the, the, the Chinese or the whatever you want to call yourself. I call myself a human being, so therefore I don't worry about it. Call me anything you want, but I'm still just a human being. But when you start breaking up into clans, you weaken and you cause internal conflict. And that's what Satan wants. And that's, if you, if you ever watch and listen to the liberal agenda on television, you'll see that what they want is division. Christians are to unite, to hold up one another, to comfort one another, to strengthen one another, to keep our homes as God would have us do, rather than as Satan would have us do. And I'm sure that a lot of the older folks here they did their very best when it came to raising their children. It didn't mean they were perfect at it, but they didn't have to be perfect. They just had to be steadfast in God's Word. So, all of this makes us even more vulnerable to our enemies. And finally, as far as these seven stages go, Unbelief in God became more complete, parental authority diminished, and ethical and moral principles disappeared, affecting the economy and the government. Thus, by internal weakness and fragmented <coughs> fragmentation, the societies came apart. There was no way to save them except by a dictator who rose from within or by barbarians who invaded from without. Well, we've seen dictators rise from within other countries. And just recently, we had a president in India killed because of his beliefs not as a traitor, not as a dictator, but because he wanted freedom for his people. And they murdered him. How often do you see people being persecuted here in the United States? Take our recent January 6th. People outside who were doing nothing more than showing their loyalty to a president that, or an ex-president at that point and trying to protest their government peacefully were locked up. They did nothing. I'm not talking about the ones that broke the glass. I'm not talking about the ones that went inside. I'm not talking about the ones that propped their feet on Nancy Pelosi's desk. I'm talking about the ones outside. There were thousands of them, thousands, and hundreds and hundreds of them were arrested, called trespassers, and some of them are still sitting in jail today. That's what happens when you have the eventual breakdown of the home. It leads to all this mess that we've got going on today. This is no different than Rome or Greece or anyone else. There was a time you could come to this country, you came here to be free, you came here to worship God but in your own way, but you came here and knew you would be safe. Well, now we've got people coming here illegally, invading our country, and nobody will do anything about it because liberals 
don't like the conservative idea that we have a have to have a border. This all has been breaking down since the early 60s. And a lot of it started taking place during uh, the mid 60s in 65, 64. With all this love, peace, and so forth mess that was going on with hippies and, and what have you, well, that, their parents weren't taking care of them. In the 50s, if you got pregnant, they wanted to send you somewhere so that they wouldn't be embarrassed if you got pregnant out of wedlock. Or they wanted you to give up the child if you weren't old enough to take care of it. That was in the 50s and the 40s, and probably further on back than that. 60s come along? No, uh-uh. Free love, let's, let's just do our thing, and we'll just bring the kids up however we want. We won't give them a, a, a solid home, a solid community to live in. So, with no godly principles for them to follow, this of course has an effect again on not just our society, but our government. And it causes internal weakness and fragmentation. The societies just fly apart and ours is flying apart now. There was no way to save them, like I said, except you get a dictator. Is that what you want? Well, if I want a dictator, I want God. I don't want some guy out here who thinks he is God. I want God. Our nation is in trouble. Crime in our nation is soared. People often live in fear and uh, of being accosted, beaten, robbed, raped, murdered, etc. We read of drive-by killings all the time. And others avenging themselves of some supposed wrong in killing anyone around them. And there's another type of murder that the Supreme Court at one time legalized and has now at least taken a step back from that. And that was abortion. And t let me tell you, abortion still goes on today. It's just that it's been brought back to the states. It's no longer a, a national thing. So it's still around. And there's still the sins of homosexuality. Now that caused God to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities of the plain in Genesis chapter 19, and you can read about it in Jude chapter 7. It was first foisted upon us with the idea that uh, it's just an alternative lifestyle. They weren't satisfied with uh, what they had, and they, and they wished to pervert the sacred institution of marriage. Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain were destroyed for their homosexuality. How long will it be till God destroys this nation? Think about it. Historians have given ten stages of a nation's birth to its downfall. The first stage moves from bondage to spiritual faith. The second stage is from spiritual faith to great courage. The third stage moves from great courage to liberty. The fourth stage moves from liberty to abundance. And the fifth stage moves from abundance to selfishness. The sixth stage moves from selfishness to complacency. And the seventh stage moves from complacency to apathy. The eighth stage moves from apathy to moral decay. And the ninth stage comes from moral decay to dependence. And tenth and last, the last stage moves from dependence to what? 
bondage. Well, ask yourself, which stage is our nation in today? We're not in bondage yet, but we're awfully close to it. This leads us to the last point I want to make. And that's the foundation of the church, of you here. With the destruction of the home and the lack of respect for authority being seen, it should be no wonder that the church of our Lord is being affected. Children fail to learn to respect their parents. Then they disrespect, uh, that disrespect spills over into every aspect of life, school, government, and the church. We've seen this disrespect manifest itself in the attitude toward all spiritual things. Some have shown such disrespect for God that on one occasion, a person addressed the Father in a public prayer as, Hey, Daddy-o! It's real respectful, isn't it? How many times do we hear God being spoken of as a man upstairs? They need to get a vision of God as did Isaiah when he saw his vision and the one uh, Sarah cried to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts and the whole, the whole earth full of glory. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3. This scene caused Isaiah to say, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. In chapter 6 verse 5. Brethren, today need to be the people that God's uh, name should be held in reverence. Reverence. Respect all. Not, hey, daddy -o. We're continuing to see an erosion of respect for all authoritative and all sufficient written word of God. James Woodruff wrote the idea of adhering to the written word is noble, but it is fraught with as many problems as there was as there are people viewing the word. Remember that old thing called the new hermeneutic? came along with a yeah, that says it was it, it, it was really anything but new it was just a rejection of what the Bible said it's just the rejection of the authoritative pattern that God has given us Man wanted it his way. This is a book of suggestions, not a way to live. That's what the new hermeneutic wanted you to believe. As a result of the disrespect of God's Word, there's been changes made in worship, the way the church worships, the work of the church, the organization of the church, the fellowship of the church, and even the scheme of redemption found in the scriptures. As a result of these changes, the very nature of the church itself has been altered. And eventually, it becomes nothing but another denomination just with the Church of Christ's name on it. Denominations were never built by God. They're Satan's doing. God set up one church. 
his church. So I want to leave you with this. The lesson will be yours then. When the foundation in the home is destroyed, society will follow in its destruction and the church will be ruined. Unless things are built upon the solid foundation of God and His Word, then those foundations will ultimately be destroyed. However, we do have hope. If we live righteously, we will be justified. So I leave the lesson with you. It's strictly up to you whether you believe one word of what I've said. But God's word backs all of this up. Folks, we're destroying ourselves by allowing our nation to become an un or a godless nation. What was it Ronald Reagan said? We're only one uh, society, one, one uh, generation away of losing our freedom. Do you think that's what our forefathers wanted? The fathers of this nation, they gave us a set of rules, just like God gave, uh, gave Christians His rules. The fathers of this nation gave us a set of rules. It's called the Constitution. It's called the Bill of Rights. But we treated it just like God, not like God's Word's been treated. Just throw it on the trash heap. Let's do things our way. Well, we can't do that as a nation. We can't do that as Christians. We can't do it. Now I'm going to ask you today, if you're here and you're not a Christian, you have the opportunity to become one. You've heard a portion of God's Word. It's not all of it. But you've heard a portion of it. All you have to do is choose to believe it. So if you believe it, then what do you do? Well, you hear, you believe, then you got to repent. Well, what's repent mean? Repent means stop doing the bad things you're doing now, turn around and walk away from them and don't do them anymore. It's a military term. It means do it about face. Then what do you have to do? Now, this gets a little tricky. Some people say, well, you got to confess your sins. No. You confess that Jesus is Christ, the Son of the living God. You deal with confessing your sins afterwards. You have to confess that Jesus is the Christ, that He came, He died on the cross to save you from your sins. Then you have to do that horrible thing that everybody out there thinks is so horrible, be baptized. You may have been dumped under water before. Doesn't make you baptized unless you did it for the proper reason. Being baptized is when you come in contact with the blood of Christ and that washes away your sins. And that's not sprinkling, that's not pouring. That is literally being immersed under water and come back up in a newness of life as a new creation. Now, if you're here and you're a Christian, you have something that you may need to get off your chest or something that you need to, to confess publicly, whatever the case may be, we're here for you. And you can come forward and make your need known. If you've done something publicly that you shouldn't have done and other people saw it, well, then confess it publicly. If it's not, if it's not public, that's between you and God. You have to repent and you have to talk with Him. But if you're not a Christian today, you can be. And I recommend that you do so. 
Will your life get easier? Nope. Not one single bit. But will you know that you're saved? Yes. If you follow those five terms that God set out for us. So, that's all I have to say. The lesson is yours. And if you feel like you need to come forward and do so as we stand and sing the song that has been selected. Thank mm -hmm. you.